So starting off this morning is Brian Helmkamp. Did I pronounce that right, Brian? Close enough. All right. So Brian, a um, couple of high points. Brian currently runs a company called Code Climate. How many people are familiar with Code Climate? Okay. If you're not, check it out. Um, great product. I started using it after RubyConf. Um, after I sh he showed me the demo at RubyConf, we started using it for our teams at AT&T for the projects that we have. Um, so in addition to Code Climate, Brian is also heavily involved and is one of the lead organizers for Garuko. So I got clearance from him before using his Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> and Garuko, for those of you who aren't aware, is a conference that takes place in New York City. It's a similar single day, single track conference. Um, well worth the trip, and it's a great excuse to go to New York. Um, so with that, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is Brian is also, uh, was a, a Ruby, or is, is a Ruby hero as of 2009. If you're not familiar with the Ruby Heroes program, uh, Google it and check it out. It's a community effort where we actually take the time to recognize uh, about half a dozen members of the community each year for their extensive contributions to what we do and to help grow in the community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian for a discussion that is not about Enterprise Rails, if you saw <laughs> that on the schedule. Oh, yeah. uh, refresh your schedule this morning. We're talking about refactoring active record. Is this mic on? Can people hear me okay? Okay, cool. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, that was a very nice introduction. I'd like to begin with a little bit of group therapy. So think back to the last time you were working on a completely greenfield application. Uh, there was no legacy code, there was no technical debt, it was just uh, you, you had a test suite that was comprehensive, but it ran really quickly, you had a backlog of features, and you were just in your editor tearing through them. Can everyone think back to the last time they had that feeling? Give me an adjective for how you felt when you were working like that, just toss one out there. Anybody got one? Fun, productive, anything else? What's that? Enabled, yes, great, sane. So, <laughs> so the green field feeling is great, right? The problem is that as your requirements increase and you start adding developers to the project and the requirements start changing, it's kind of like having cows entering your green field. <laughs> and the problem with letting cows in your green field is after a while they have a tendency to turn a green field into a brown field. And then you're sort of in that position where you feel like you're fighting your code base. Have you ever had that feeling where it feels like you have to change everything to get one thing done and it's your struggle? Your app is your adversary, then you have to beat it into submission? That's a brown field, right? So my name is Brian Helmkamp. Uh, I'm the founder of Code Climate. It's a hosted automated service that does reviews of the Ruby code in your applications. And today, I'd like to talk about one particular aspect of this problem as it relates to Rails applications. We're going to look at ways to deal with complexity in our model layer and how we might be able to manage that complexity more effectively to prevent our green fields from turning brown. So as a quick warning, uh, this talk is going to move really fast. I'm going to try to cover seven patterns and one anti-pattern with an intro and an outro and time for questions in about 40 minutes. So if you haven't had coffee yet, uh, God help you. Um, I'd like to begin with a quote. Rails makes it natural and easy to build large, well-designed, object-oriented systems. Do you know who said that? I don't... <laughs> I don't think anybody has ever said that, at least not to me. Um, but why is that? I think in that context, when someone might refer to Rails, they're really referring to the active record pattern. So we have to go back to what the active record pattern is to understand this feeling. Active record was documented in Martin Fowler's book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. And if you go back to the source text, 
uh, he sort of clearly le lays out some implications of using the pattern. The biggest advantage is simplicity. And we feel this every day when we need to create a new model and layer on some quick and dirty uh, CRUD sort of behavior, plug it into some forms, and, and do reads and writes from our database. So it's very simple, and we can do that quickly. On the other hand, active records are, by definition, directly coupled to your database schema. The problem with this is if you have a small database schema that isn't sort of expanding all the time, and you restrict yourself strictly to the active record pattern, the tools that you end up with to manage complexity in your domain and in your model layer are very limited, right? If you only have five tables, but you have all sorts of behaviors layered on top of them, and you only have five classes, those five classes are going to become pretty problematic pretty quickly. Sometimes when people talk about object-oriented systems, they use the term ravioli code, and this can have sort of a positive or negative connotation depending on who's talking about it or the context, but I'm going to use the positive one here, which is that you've got these little individual units of code which are loosely coupled. They're all sort of sliding around in the same bowl, and they coordinate together to feed you dinner. Rails is calzone code. <laughs> uh, I believe David Chalimsky coined this phrase. Uh, and if you look at the picture, you can just sort of get the feeling for, for why this fits. Your active records tend to be these big chunks, right? And you, can, you only have a few of them. If you eat more than two calzones, you're just going to feel really sick. Uh, so today, we're going to look at a lot of ways to turn calzones into ravioli. The problem with calzones is that they can tend to grow to even be god objects. And if I were to look at your applications today, I would be fairly confident that there's at least two god objects in your application. Probably user or account, whatever you want to call it, and whatever the model is that's core to your application domain. So if you're an e-commerce uh, application, I would bet that the user class and the order class are probably the worst code that you've got to deal with. And you probably dread going in there and making changes, because who knows what's going to fly out the other side. So how do we solve this? Uh, in the past, people have talked about the idea of skinny controllers and fat models. Uh, they want their controllers to be limited in responsibility, to do one thing and one thing well, and then offload that responsibility to someone else. So the controllers are very easy to understand, and that you don't feel like you have to fight with them. Unfortunately, I think skinny controller as a phrase has done perhaps as much damage as it's done good. And there's a clear alternative, right? Skinny controllers and skinny models. Notice the pluralization on model to models. And there's no reason we can't have the benefits of well-encapsulated objects with limited responsibilities in our model layer, just like we can have them in our control layer. On to the patterns. So, there's going to be a lot of code in the remaining slides. It, if, you can see, if you can read the text on the bottom that says, can you read this, then you'll be able to read it on the projector. If you can't read that, you should pull up this GitHub repository, which is going to have all the code samples in it. It's github.com slash codeclimate slash refactoring dash fat dash models. Uh, and if you don't have a laptop, just maybe you can share over someone's shoulder. But I want to begin with an anti-pattern. So whenever the topic of refactoring active records comes up, one of the first things that people will talk about or sort of want to uh, understand is this idea of extracting mixins. And when I say mixins, I mean Ruby modules. So this would be like if you have a user class that's in a social networking context, and it has a couple associations and some behaviors around knowing whether it's friends or not with a certain person or blocked or something, you might include a a uh, friending module or a uh, include blocking. So you know your user gets these things layered on. I don't really like this. Uh, I think that uh, the behavior that you get when you include modules is akin to inheritance. So you're basically, in kind of an obscure way, creating complex multiple inheritance hierarchies in your application. And what's worse than that is you've basically created junk, a junk drawer system. So if your user class has 1,000 lines in it, it's kind of like sweeping just those lines under five separate rugs, right? You can't really see it. Now it's all split up. But what have you really improved? And the worst part about it is that it, by having your complexity swept under five different rugs, it becomes actually more difficult to identify concepts that can be given first class names and representations in your system. It can make it harder to refactor later from that spot. 
So I've been saying this for a while, that any application with an app concerns directory is concerning. <laughs> Come to find out, Rails 4 generates an app concerns directory by default. <laughs> I think I'm being trolled. Uh, so let's go to the actual patterns. The first pattern is value objects. Value objects are simple, plain Ruby objects whose equality is dependent on their value and not their identity. And as such, they're often but not always immutable. And we can look at an example of that. In, in this Ruby standard library, you've got, you know, in the kernel, you've got things like fixnum and float. Uh, in the standard library, you have classes like URI and pathname. Those are all great examples of value objects, and they sort of layer on nice behaviors. In this case, we have an, a fat active record model. This one's from Code Climate, and it's Code Climate's representation of a class in your system. So we understand information about the classes that you have. We might write a row to the database called a constant, which is for your class definition. And every class gets a rating from A to F based on a cost that we associate with the class. So the cost is sort of our estimation of how difficult it would be to fix the smells that we've identified. Based on the cost, the rating could be anything from an A to an F. Now, the problem with this code is that, well, the first thing I would notice is that there are three methods that all have a repeated word in the name or arguments list. That's almost always going to be a telltale sign that you're missing an object. When you start having repeated prefixes, suffixes, uh, words uh, that sort of travel together in method names, and a rating can't exist on its own in this case. The only way to do anything with a rating like figure out if one rating is higher than another, is to have a constant that has that rating and then ask it uh, whether the rating is higher than another constant's rating. So a refactoring that you could take here is to introduce a value object. We'll introduce a class, which is a rating, and just gave it a little bit of behavior to start. So in here we've sort of added a simple factory method. It gave us a nice place to map between costs and the appropriate rating. We've also defined the 2s method. So if you put it into a string interpolation, it'll come back out just like you want it. And you can layer in some behaviors. So by using comparable in the spaceship operator, now we have ratings that can be sorted uh, or compared against one another. We can ask a rating what the next worst rating is. So if you have a b, you want to get back c, c to d, and on. And we have a convenience method for asking if one rating is higher than another. And by defining the hash and equal methods, now we can use ratings as keys in Ruby hashes, and they'd work just like you would expect, which is really useful for code climate because we do a lot of operations where we need to group uh, different data by ratings. So we want to show you all of the classes that have a D rating. And to initialize that, it's very simple, right? You just define a method called rating in your constant, and you use the factory method to produce the correct rating object. Uh, if you've seen the active record feature called composed of, it's kind of a macro to basically do the same thing, to layer in value objects into your models. I think it might be deprecated in part just because it's so simple to do it yourself. So never be afraid to sort of just add in uh, a simple method like this that just turns back an object. It doesn't even need to return the same instance every time because we've set it up so that if you have two instances of the rating B, they'll always be equal. So you just create the object, and if the object passes out of scope, it gets garbage collected and everything's fine. So the implications, as we saw, we now, value objects can be made to be comparable. They can be used as hash keys. With the 2s method, we can make it easy to interpolate them into strings, and they provide a convenient place for factory methods. I like to use them uh, whenever you've got an attribute that tends to have logic that hangs around with it. Uh, URI, for example, we often need to split out the host from the port and that sort of thing. Data clumps are a good example. If you ever have pieces of data that travel together through your system and it doesn't really make sense to have one of them without the other, like to have a street number without a street name, that's a good place for a value object. And if you find yourself using primitives in lots of places, if you're sort of just restricting yourself to the, the tools that Ruby gives you out of the box and you're having to contort those objects into, do, into doing more complex behaviors, that can be a good place to look at value objects. The second pattern is fairly broad. Uh, so this is the idea of service objects. And service objects, broadly defined, are kind of just an objects that represent standalone operations within your code base. They tend to have a short life cycle, so I like to just instantiate new ones and then use them once and then throw them away. 
Uh, and sometimes they're stateless, but if they're not stateless because of their natural life cycle being short-lived, the state's going to go away pretty quickly anyway. So they're pretty simple to work with. Let's look at an example. In this case, we have a user class that has two different ways that authentication can take place. We can authenticate with a password using the bcrypt library. That might be the algorithm that our sessions controller needs to use. But additionally, we have a method for doing token-based authentication, perhaps from an API. And this method here at the bottom, I won't go into the details of why it's necessary, but we need to do a secure compare function when we're validating the API tokens to avoid making ourselves vulnerable to timing attacks. The problem with this is that the user class already has to include n different strategies for doing authentication. So if we wanted to introduce a third way to do authentication, perhaps with a mobile phone, you're just continuing to expand and expand the responsibility of the user object. And this secure compare method, it's right under the token authenticate method in this example, but in real life, that's probably buried at the bottom of your private method definitions, maybe 100, 200 lines from the token authenticate method, which is part of the public interface. And it doesn't really make sense to say, what is a secure compare in the context of a user? Right? There's kind of a mismatch there. So how could we do it better? We could introduce service objects for the two different authentication strategies. So a password authenticator could use a bcrypt password in order to authenticate users that are coming in with sessions. And a token authenticator could compare, securely compare API tokens with provided tokens. Now the secure compare function is still a utility function just kind of hanging out at the bottom. You can make the argument that we're still missing an object, but at least the co uh, correlation between token authentication and secure comparison of strings is made much more direct. Right? There's no 200 lines of code sitting in between those two things. And of course, they're easy to use in the controller. Right? We can just initialize a password authenticator with the user that's required and then call authenticate on, on the authenticator instead of calling a method on the user. So what do we get out of this? We get simpler models. That's what we wanted. Uh, we avoid the situation of sort of callback hell, where you have lots and lots of callbacks layered on top of each other, coordinating across different objects. And it's really hard to know what's going to happen when. We can clean up duplication in the controller layer. So if you've ever had to add an API to an application and there's some cruft in the controllers, you might very well end up repeating it between the API versions of the controllers and the regular versions of the controllers. For example, if you have side effects that might happen, happen after someone places an order, you can extract those into a service object that deals with placing an order and then use that from both controllers. And when you're doing something like that, it has the advantage of making behavior opt-in instead of opt-out. So your active record model maintains its simplicity. It can be used to interact with the database, and you know exactly what's going to happen. But when you need higher level behaviors on top of that, you can reach for the service objects, but only when you need them. So I like to use service objects. In this case, that was an example of having multiple strategies of doing the same thing. If you only have one way to do it, but it's, it's particularly complex in and of itself, you might still want to get it out of the active record layer and encapsulate it into a service object. If you're coordinating between multiple models, that can be a really good reason. So maybe placing an order involves saving credit cards and also managing shipping addresses. If you're dealing with external services, so you need to query your payment gateway before you allow an order to go through. Or if you have an ancillary concern. Let's say you have some logic where you need to clean up old data, but it only runs once a month on a cron job. You don't want to give that that logic sort of top real estate in your active record model where you're going to be working all the time. You can sort of get it out of there and get it pushed over to the side. Third pattern, form objects. So form objects simply are a way to deal with the problem of having one form that needs to coordinate with multiple models. If you've done Rails programming for a while, you know that this is like a feeling of dread, right? You get the mock-up from your designer, and it's like, wait, there's four models on this form. How can we do that? Right? So Rails has all these powerful tools for making uh, putting applications together very easy, but it doesn't really have good solutions for this. So if you've got a form object, you're probably going to be using that in a creator update flow. That's when you most often are dealing with multiple models in a single operation. And I like to make my form objects uh, quack like active record objects. And we'll see how that works in a second. So here's an example. Uh, I've seen this sort of thing before. I don't know if you've seen it too. But this user class has been sort of extended, quote unquote, uh, to support the feature of being able to have a sign up that requires a username, email address, and a company name all in the same form. And then when the form's submitted, we're going to create a company record and also a user record. So the person added an adder accessor to the user for the company name, and then a before create callback, which creates the company 
before the user is created and assigns the association. Have you guys ever seen code like this? It's a little bit hairy, and it's got a few problems. One, if the user save fails after the company save, it's sort of unclear what state your database is going to be left in. You have to start thinking about, like, well, when's the, like, is there a transaction here? What's going to be sent when, and when's it going to be rolled back? Um, the company method is, is what I call a shapeshifter method. Sometimes it returns, the company represents a string, and sometimes it represents a full object. Uh, and additionally, if you just want to create a user but ha not create a company, it's not clear how you would do that. And that's certainly going to cause you trouble, at least in your test suite, but very often in the rest of your application as well. So let's refactor it. We can introduce a form object called a signup. When I'm doing form objects, I like to use the Virtus library. It's just a really lightweight library for extending a plain Ruby object with attribute-like behavior. So it gives an initialize method where if you pass it a hash, it'll do what you would expect. Um, so we can declare that this has a few attributes. It has the name, the email, the company name. It might have validations. And we're going to expose an adder reader for the user in the company, which will come in handy in a second. Then we make it quack like active record. So we define a save method. Just like active record, our save method is going to first validate the object. And if the validation succeeds, it's going to persist. When you start to ask questions like, what does it mean to persist a signup, the answer is very clearly laid out in the signup class. First, we're going to create the company. And then we're going to create the user hanging off that association. We're also populating the instance variables so any coordinating code is able to access the user of the company that were created during the operation. And because it quacks like an active record, the signups controller becomes very simple. We just instantiate the signup and save it as if it were a model. So what do we get out of this? We're layering the concept of aggregation into a single form onto the individual objects. I really like this approach in other contexts as well to separate the idea of the many from the idea of the single, right? So we've done that. We've limited the responsibility of our active records, always a good thing. And we've uh, introduced a place to deal with contextual validations. So this is a little subtle, but most of the time, when you have validations on, say, a sign-up form, those are validations that might change over the life cycle of the business. And you can't go back and just say that all of the previous users are invalid and therefore shouldn't save properly. So many validations, even if they're not defined as such, are actually really important depending on the context they're going through. So if you have validations that are only relevant to sign up, you now have a natural place to put them. Uh, when to use, pretty straightforward. Whenever you're aggregating multiple models into a form, and if you ever see accepts nested attributes for, I hate this method. This is probably my least favorite method in all of Rails. Uh, it's been, had all sorts of bugs uh, because it's not very, you know, it's complex, right? And complexity becomes a breeding ground for bugs. But you can replace uses of accepts nested attributes for with uh, form objects, and I think you'll be a lot happier. The fourth pattern is query objects. So query objects are just objects that encapsulate a single way to query the database. And let's look at an example. This is not that unusual, and in and of itself, it might not be that bad. But we have an account that is imported from an external system. So we have to run a tuple, couple types of queries in order to figure out which accounts are ready to be imported, and perhaps which accounts have attempted to be imported, but the import process has failed. And that requires joining against an imports table. The issue here is you're kind of gumming up the top of your uh, active record class with a, with a bunch of These could be scopes. In this case, they're class methods. They're sort of interchangeable. But if you have a bunch of these, you end up pushing down the important behavior of the object, which is what its instances do, right? That's the key for objects. What do the instances do? That gets pushed way down the file, right? And for me, I understand the benefit of dropping down to SQL for certain types of queries. I think that's the right way to go. But if I'm just scanning through a Ruby file and I get big blocks of SQL, that's always kind of just throws me off. And I'm sort of like, wait, why is, what is this doing? Why is that there? So what are better ways to manage that complexity? If you introduce a query object, you can just define a class which is responsible for executing one and only one query. It can be initialized with a relation, which has some nice benefits that we'll see in a second. And then you just move that query out from the top of your active record model into its own object. You provide a find each method, and then if you have something like a background job that needs to page through accounts that need to be imported and import them, you just call that with a block, and you get the behavior that you would expect. Like I said, these can be composed. So if you want to only import accounts that are both importable and were created more than a month ago, 
you can create a relation that represents accounts that were created more than a month ago, pass that into your initializer, which has a nice default, so you don't need to always do that, and then you can build the behaviors on top of one another. So what does this get us? We can focus the active record on the core behavior. We get composable objects. And because these are now first class objects, that encourages refactoring. So this is going to be a theme that will come up a few more times. But I love first class objects. And I don't like things that are not first class objects. Uh, I don't like class methods. I think they are difficult to refactor. But when you get things into an object, suddenly your entire OOP toolbox becomes readily available to you in a clear way. You can do things like composition, inheritance. You can introduce state naturally without having to do big contortions and worrying about introducing global variables accidentally. So when would I use this? Uh, if I have lots of scopes, all with subtle variations at the top of my active record, if I have complicated scopes where I'm going to be you know, taking eight lines to run a query, that might be a good case for factoring it out into a separate object. Or if I have rarely used scopes. So if there's something that is a uh, simple scope, but it's only really relevant for a ancillary operation in the domain, then maybe it should be in an ancillary file in the code base. The fifth pattern is view objects. So view objects are what I like to use to refer to objects that back up a template or a partial. And they might depend on 0, 1, or multiple models. I've seen sort of all three of these cases. We'll look at an example. So picture LinkedIn. LinkedIn likes to give you a percentage completion of how far along the onboarding process you are, and they like to give you a next step. It's a really nice thing for them to do. But you don't want to just stick this stuff in your user model, or you might end up with code like this. The problem with this code, again, we've got repeated method prefixes. So you can see the onboarding prefix is, is manifesting itself in at least two methods. And more importantly, you've got this non-critical concern in the critical code path of a user, right? So almost by definition, things that you're going to tell a user to do as kind of hints as, we'd love for you to do this as the next step, it's not really critical logic because the user might not just might not do it, right? So there's no real behavior that hangs off of that. Uh, it's just kind of like a nice to have a layer that you're introducing into the UI. So instead of putting that logic into the user, I might introduce a view object and call it something like onboarding steps. You can initialize the onboarding steps object with the user, and you can provide it two methods for returning the message of what we should tell the user to do next and how far along their pro uh, progress is in getting set up. This will let us remove the prefix, and it creates a nice mapping where you kind of have this like one-to-one -one relationship between your templates and the classes backing them which means that you've got a clear place to put any logic that might otherwise make its way into the template itself or just kind of get shoveled away into a helper. So what did we do? Like we said, we, had, we have simpler templates. If you've read about the two-step view pattern, this is kind of an implementation of that. If you're not familiar with two-step view, I think it's one that's probably an under, uh, underused pattern that people should at least understand when you're considering how to deal with complexity in your view layer. Uh, you can avoid helpers. Uh, with, and again, you can have first class objects that encourage composition and refactoring. You can inherit different view objects from one another. You can use one inside of another. Uh, all this stuff is very difficult if that logic is stuck in a calzone active record model. So if you, I like to use these whenever I have display logic in the model, if it's something that is clearly only related to presentation. If it's delivery mechanism specific, so if I take a step back and say, you know, what if I got rid of the web app and just made this application voice activated, sort of over a phone line, would this be as relevant to the application? If the answer is no, I try to get it out of there, get it into a view object. And whenever I see a partial, if it's doing anything non-trivial and it doesn't seem to map sort of one to one to a object that's backing it that can encapsulate all of the logic, then I'm going to be reaching for a view object pretty quickly. The sixth pattern is policy objects. So when I say policy objects, I'm talking about objects that encapsulate a single business rule, and they tend to be focused on reads. So it's about making a determination given data in your system, not updating that information. Here's an example. Uh, everybody has dealt with this problem at one point in the other, I think, uh, time or another, I think. It's the problem of deciding which email notifications to send to your user. In this case, we've got about four conditionals. We need to make sure that emails to that user have not hard bounced. 
We need to make sure that the user's preferences allow for them to receive notifications of the given type. And if the notification that's about to be sent is project specific, we want to make sure that the user has opted in to receiving notifications about that specific project. So it's a complex conditional statement. And what's worse here, from my perspective, is that you've got a very important uh, domain concept masquerading as a method that's just sort of floating in a sea of other methods in the user object. Knowing which uh, emails are going to be sent to which users is really important and in most web applications. So you can promote it into a first class object, and then it makes it easier to, when you have to answer questions. You ever have that product owner who walks up to you and says, hey, what emails are we really sending to people when that happens? You have, now you have an object that you can go to that gives you the answer for that. In this case, it's sort of a method object extraction. We have an email notification policy that's initialized with a user, a notification type, and a project, and then makes a determination about whether or not an email should be delivered based on some Boolean logic combining those things. We've also provided a nice place where we can extract methods. Now, we could have extracted a method inside of the user class, right? That refactoring was pretty readily available to us, but it creates this situation where you're, again, you're going to have a public interface very far away in your active record class, potentially, from the private methods that compose it. And you end up with a, just a complete hodgepodge of private methods at the bottom of your active record, which are all doing, about doing like seven different things. So we've taken one business rule and encapsulated it in one object, which is nice because, again, first class objects are a win. And in the particular case of policy objects, they're often ripe for building, uh, sort of aggregating these together with composites, right? So sometimes you have business rules which layer on top of other business rules. Au authorization is a common case for this, right? You have fine-grained authorization rules, and then you have high-level authorization rules that might be built on them. If that's a problem that is really well modeled by a series of objects connected together rather than a series of methods in your user class that all call one another. So I like policy objects for complicated reads. I would say the case of the four-branch four conditional that we saw would be complex in my book, and also ancillary reads. It depends on how core is answering this policy question uh, to the domain model. If the read itself is simple and not ancillary, it's core. So maybe you have an invoice and you need to know whether it's paid or not, right? That's a really core piece of behavior about an invoice, is whether it was paid or not. In that case, I would not want to extract a policy object because it's, that's where the active record pattern really shines, is having simple behaviors layered on top of your data. And this would be probably too much abstraction in that case. The seventh pattern is decorators. So decorators, uh, you may have be familiar with this. They're about wrapping another object and layering on additional behavior. You create an object that responds to either the entire wrapped objects interface or sometimes just a segment of it. And let's look at an example. In this case, we've got an order which needs to send email receipts when it's placed. However, we only want to send email receipts for an order if the order was placed online by a customer. If the order came in over the phone or through fax to a customer service representative, we don't want to send an email receipt. So in this case, the programmers added an adder accessor to the order active record called placed online. And what they're going to use this for is seeding it with a Boolean value, depending on the controller that's going to create the order with either something false or true. And then they've created a conditional callback. So if placed online was seeded with a truthy value, the email receipt uh, callback is going to fire. The, let's go back. The problem is placed online is sort of a hack, right? It doesn't really make sense except for being this value to decide whether or not to run the callback. And you've got a callback that only fires sometimes, right? So it's definitely not a core behavior of the object's lifecycle. It's only a, a behavior in half of the contexts. You can introduce an order email notifier, which is a decorator. So it's going to wrap the order. And the only thing we need to add logic to is the save method. So if the order save succeeds, then we want to send an email. Now, in the orders controller, this is the orders controller that deals with processing orders from customers on the website in the case where we, need, we do need to send emails. We separate out a little bit of logic for building up the order with any decorators that are relevant. Uh, in this case, we need to send email receipts. We might also want to have a decorator which notifies the warehouse if the order's size is above a certain quantity. We build up the order, and then the create method 
just works with the order as if it was an order, right? To the, from the perspective of the create method, it is an order. Uh, and it, we have something that still quacks like an order. But there are these other behaviors that were layered on. So with that, we get this nice separa sep separation between arrangement and work, uh, which I think is a, a nice pattern where you've got some code which is responsible for wiring together a bunch of objects which are going to do the right thing, and then you've got the code which actually does the right thing. We've promoted the concept of emailing receipts about orders into a first-class domain object, and we've made it opt-in instead of opt-out. So you're never going to accidentally send an email receipt when you, say, write a cron job that needs to iterate through all of the orders and make a small change to them. So I like using this pattern if you have contextual behavior. That was this case, where you only want to send email receipts for some of the orders, depending on how they were placed. If you have behavior that interacts with external web services, you're basically never going to want to put that into a callback. If you've ever put an external web service call into an active record callback, you know the pain that that will lead you to very quickly. Uh, so decorators can help you deal with that. And some people like to use decorators in the view layer. I deliberately uh, sort of took this in a different direction because I'm focused on models today. But there are gems like Draper that are specifically designed to make it easy to layer on additional behavior in the view layer. So that's the seven patterns. I want to leave you with one more concept before we go to questions. You have to use your judgment whenever you're applying patterns like this and building up design and architecture in your code base. So if you wait too long to introduce good design and architecture in your code base, you're going to end up in that brown field, right? You're going to feel like you're stuck up to your knees in mud, and it's very difficult to get things done. You're going to have to dig yourself out of that hole. But at the same time, you don't want to over-engineer it from the start, right? Rails allows us to get a lot done very quickly, and with, uh, uh, there's a conceptual overhead any time we introduce new concepts like this. So you don't want to end up too far on either side of the curve. Ideally, your design and architecture will grow incrementally as the complexity or the features of your application increases. So it's not this huge step function where we go from not doing any design to, over, you know, to designing everything perfectly. You want to sort of gradually increase those things as they correlate together. So think about that when you're looking at applying these patterns to your application. Thank you.